I'm the old bull, Playable Games, and um, with me today is our head of games, Daniel Visser, and his 2IC, Bo Bennett, who Bye, are nice. the, the, leading, the leading dev team guys in the Playable Games team. They own a company called Glinda Games, and um, Daniel, being our head of games, basically saved us from disaster with one of the games we bought. That where the dev team just wasn't capable of actually finishing it. So um, we basically had a very long set of meetings where Daniel and Bo piece by piece worked out what was wrong with that game and what would have to happen to get it ready for market and then presented Playable with a, a solution, which was to move on and restart. And they were going to help us out financially to make sure that it all measured up at the same at the end which they have done and we've achieved it, which is amazing. So, so let's get started with just a few quick, a quick couple of quick fire questions. So let's see how we go. Well, so, well, so tell me what you think a game developer is. You guys should actually okay. know the answer to this one. Oh, <laughs> it might. It, it depends. Uh, it's a multi. So there's a few definitions. Well, if you're one guy and you're a game developer and you're doing everything, then you would be a game developer. But if you're a sound designer or a you know a VFX guy or you're a or an executive producer or a QA guy or a tester or you know you're okay, still a game so developer. so you guys, so if someone is working at a game developing company, but they're not able to do the complete suite, mm. we don't turn them a game developer. Do we just Term them by yeah, their, no, their I think skill. Well, you would term you would term the company, wouldn't you? The whole widget as the game developer, because if you're a music guy, you can do music for anything. Yeah, it's a. I think there's a few definitions. I mean, for me, and maybe I'm a bit biased because my background is this, but you know, I always think that a game is a program. It's a computer program at the end of the day. So I think, in the strictest sense of the word, a game developer is is maybe a programmer because you always need yeah. Uh, yeah. Pr uh, a program uh, uh, kind of, you know, um, but you, you're right. If well, you know, that term full stack developer or, you know, um, you know, um, start to finish developer, uh, you, well, it starts with the idea. It depends what kind of the developer you are, phase. right? Tec technic yeah. exactly. Sorry, Tec you're a web developer. Details. missed that, Bo. What was that? If you're a web developer, you're not a game developer. Like if you're... A director, you make films, but if you're the gaffer or the costume designer, you don't make the film. Mm, yeah, okay, that's a good analogy. I don't know. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's so many parts, right? Game development is, you know, there's you, you make sound and you do foley and you do music and then you also do 3D modeling and then through that you do yeah. costume design and you, then you do animation and then you do direction, you do art direction, you do sound direction, so. So would you, you really guys say done... that the more rounded you are as a game developer, the better? Yeah, we used to say uh, game development is, um, is where the art and meets the science of, um, you know, uh, video, video games. It's, it is really, uh, there's definitely uh, an art side and, and a science side. You know, there's a creative side and the, and the technical, technical side. Yeah. And I think a game developer needs to have some crossover between both of those disciplines. In, yeah, like, it's, it's, like it's said, not really the... There's so many roles yeah, so in it's it. Not, it's not really the correct so, term because then you'll have, you know, yeah. you'll have the person who does the payroll and you have the HR person um, who works in a game company. So the term... At the end of the day, a game developer is someone who, who just makes a game, right? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> if you, if you make a game and produce yeah. a game, you're, you're a games yeah. developer. We're yeah. too close, old bull. Yeah, we're, we're, we're too close. It's like, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's, yeah, there's, so, like there's so many roles. All yeah. right. So how old were you when you started getting involved in making games? Well, oh. I, I was I was like six or seven years old when I when I started. Yeah, I wasn't. My, parent, my parents called me a Victorian computer. Yeah. yeah, I had a Commodore 64, so a little Commodore bit later. Yeah. yeah. I was jealous it's of people who had a Commodore 64. You're a couple of years younger than me, right? So, in uh, basic, yeah. Yeah, in basic, yep, yep. I started uh, teaching myself basic programming when I was like six, seven years old, making text adventure games in primary school. And 
type it out. That's right. Yep. Um, yeah, we had to learn. There was nothing in the library. It was yeah, those magazines or the or, or the manuals that, that came came with the computer. I started making text adventures when I was like, you know, ten in primary school. I said even even started my own company in primary school and copied my own discs, drew my own logos, <laughs> gave, gave gave them gave them around to people. But then. As the years went on, you know, you start getting to graphics and, you know, making platformers and making space games. And uh, yeah, back then, back then you could, you could do it because, you know, this is a time of Pac-Man, Space Invaders in the, in the eight, in the eight bit days. We're showing our age once again. Well, and and you had to learn how it worked. You know, you're addressing a pixel on a screen and turning it off and on and the color and, you know, you've got. 64k of RAM to do whatever you want in it, you know. Now it's like when you said game developer. Now a lot of it's provided for you, but you still need the spark, and you still need the idea, and you still need to be able to follow through and get it to the end. So I wouldn't say it's easier now. I think it's exactly the same. I think um, there's a lot more to do now than what you had to do in the past. So oh, but it's still the same because we're going to make sense. We're going to make art. Um, you know, one person could do a game, but you can still do that now, depending on how complicated it's it is. It's kind of come full circle with, full the, with the, the indie scene. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the app store and stuff like that. Yeah. It's gone kind of, gone, kind of gone back. So from where game developing was to where it is now, how do you think it's changed over the last 20 years? I'll go first. Big, big um, question, obviously, but uh, uh, yeah, it is a big one. Um, I think both. But you guys on it, have like, actually. You know, been, uh, the reason I'm asking this question is you guys have actually been in the scene for the whole yeah. twenty years. So you're not like someone that joined. The, I would say thirty. I would say, I would say thirty, 30 to forty right? years. Uh, actually, um, yep. you know, uh, give, given our age, but you know, our games on the on the old Atari Twenty Six Hundred and the Vic Twenty and the Commodore Sixty Four. They they did used to be made by one person, two people, three people um uh more more often than not um you know and like Bo said you know they were 64k (laughs) in size so you only had a certain amount of graphics and sound and programming that you can put in and i remember just um that how rapidly it accelerated when i got into games Uh, and, and now now they're like you know cgi movie quality games that cost 200 million dollars to make that have 300 400 500 people so it you know the, the rate in which technology has moved and game development has moved has been, you know, it's probably almost followed Moore's law or, or, or something something like that. You know, now, what are games now? 50 gigabytes, 100 gig or, you know, something like that compared to 32K or, or 64K. So that's a bit of a nerdy, yeah. you know, uh, example. Yeah, they take they're, a they're like of all orders of magnitude. Things. Orders of magnitude larger. Now, where and, do you and see massive it productions, going? Massive productions. Where do you see it going? Well, yeah, I time? mean, uh, it'll be. Well, for a start, I mean, I used to like going to the store and buying the game. You bring it home, you finish it, you clock it, show my age again, um, and then that's it. You're done. You move on to the next thing. It's like finishing a book. You know, you get that you weird sense of closure. You know, now. The games keep going, you know, or there is no end to them, you know, or it's got microtransactions in it, or it's free to play, or, you know, um, or you play it for five minutes at a time, or they're a huge production. Um, So, or you have, you know, small teams making games, but there's no, they sort of appeal, it's all a money-making exercise, and, you know, especially things like Clash of Clans and, you know, those idle games that go forever. There's no finish to it. Okay. You could play that for 10 years, you know. Well, I've been playing um, Daisy for, for like close to 10 years, I think. I, th- I think you have mul- those anomalies, games, you know. Multiplayer games really was a big revolution uh, in in video games. Now everything is online and everything is really pretty well multiplayer. Um, yeah, you games used to take service, your computer to um, people's houses, you know. You have, you have, yeah, you have yeah, uh, updates delivered daily. Games keep on uh, evolving. Uh, you have tournaments and esports. Now, where is it going to go? 
I mean, it's a exciting times in which we live in with um, how fast technology is is accelerating. Um, I think there's no, I, I, I think it'll pol- it, it already has kind of polarized. You know, you got the big productions, the massive multi million dollar productions like like film. You know, you got your avatars and your big productions, but then you get your indie, your indie, you know, films uh, that win awards uh, at Cannes Film Festival or whatever, and you have that kind of in games as well. So there's a real polarization. When the App Store was new, it was a free for all. Everyone was releasing content of all kinds, but that also polarized the big companies came in the yeah. budgets went up games kind of got big uh, but there was still room for the, the small indie indie stuff personally where i see it going uh in the future given the advancements in um, ai uh and you know uh, i think games will start to adapt to uh, and become more pers- personalized you know you'll, you'll play skyrim um but uh, the world will uh, adapt to the way you play and and to what you say, and the you know the NPCs will become more intelligent. So I I don't know I have a hunch at the moment, given everything that's going on, is that games are going to become a lot more uh, personal and a lot more adaptive going forward. Right, it's a, a hunch. I yeah, have. I would agree. You know, and once you are once VR gets a little bit more further along, I mean, it's already there. You know. But you need that. Um, you need people to uh, to want it, and not necessarily be able to afford it, but to want it. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the the Apple headset's fantastic. That's a great price for them. That sort of augmented stuff, they sort of game in, and as Daniel said, with that personalization, I think uh, that sort of interaction, um, multiplayer with that, will be great. But it'll still be the same. People still get online, play together. They just don't have to go to each other's houses anymore to do that. The esports stuff will get bigger and bigger yeah. and bigger. I mean, people already make careers out of it. YouTube people, yeah. I think that'll get really Professional yeah, gameplay. Yeah. Our, our goal with Nexus um, is to make that an esports, so that's definitely... Well, it's it's it's, it's perfect for it. Yeah. Um, it, it really is. Um, yeah. Because well, I mean, I'm, I'm really... it doesn't matter how good you are, it changes on a dime, and then suddenly you go, oh, we're behind now. Um, yeah. Well, I'm, I'm hanging out for that first time we hear of, like, someone who, in, in the third world who's making a living out of playing one of our games. That just, I'm just, yes. gonna, I'm pumped Imagine for it. Like, absolutely pumped for it. All right. So, what's your biggest failure? Oh, God. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so you know, uh, in, in my career, I've worked on like about you know uh, two hundred plus projects. I think we've released like over a hundred titles uh, over the years. Um, it depends how you frame uh, failure. Uh, sometimes you can make a successful product where the publisher makes money, you make money, the game goes out, but it's not critically well received. So that. Could be a failure but everybody all the stakeholders you know got a return which kind of makes it um a success uh i've also had the opposite with a game that we made called jet run which was an endless runner shooter game looked great played great uh was a, it was a mobile game um uh and it was the op it, it, it was the opposite uh it was not critically uh you know well well received and uh, you know uh, just didn't didn't strike an audience and uh, didn't really make um, the the money back uh, that we that we hoped but you know it's a hit based industry you as good as your last hit and you you need to have hits so you know uh, uh, a lot uh, along the way there's uh, been definitely projects that haven't worked or projects that you know get canned or get cancelled the, the publisher pulls out or you run out of funds to finish it or whatever and they never even see the light of day so while you still learn a lot for from them um you know technically a game that doesn't get finished ultimately you know, probably can class as a failure i suppose yeah and it happens a lot. Yeah, well, it used to happen all the time. It does. You, you said, it does. Yeah. yeah, we used to be. Yeah, when I worked in other studios, it was like you know, um, bloody half the games got canned uh, during production. It was just the way the way it was, and I think that probably still happens. Okay. What about you? Uh, my biggest failure. I don't tend to look at them as failures. I tend to look at them as learning opportunities. You know, because you can always take that failure and go well. What do they do right? What do they do wrong? Um, failure is good. It's 
good to fail. You can always be better afterwards. Learn from your failures. Yep. Um, it, it often results in try, you know being too ambitious or you know not um, maybe not understanding the market uh, as well as well as well as you should. Uh, you know uh, having feature yeah, creep. I would, I, you know trying trying try to I would bite say, yeah. you can chew stuff like that. Yeah, I, I would say feature creep pushing something out to release that isn't finished. Um, you know, wasn't curated properly, uh, which means you then need to bring it back, put more work into it, cost you more money. Um, and then by the time you do that, you sometimes miss your opportunity. You miss yeah. your window and then yeah. you put it out there and that's it. It doesn't get picked up or nobody plays it or, you know, um, especially with mobile apps, you know, there's millions of those out there. Um, yeah. it's very that's hard right. to get noticed. Um, that's why Nexus is great. You know, it's a, it's an awesome game um, in an awesome space and uh, it'll stand on its own legs. Uh, but because it's, you know, part of Playable and part of crypto, it'll shove it along a little bit more. Um, cool. And you don't need the crypto to play it. So um, well, yeah. I think, it, I think it'll transcend. An absolute part of it to make sure that we don't get that backlash. We don't want a backlash from people. All right. Well, here's an easy one. What's your biggest success? Um, well, we um, we've had we've had we had a few um, o- over the years uh, from my previous company, uh, especially. Uh, we released an independent game called Catapult King, which is like a 3D Angry Birds kind of game. Early in the iPhone days, iPhone three, I think it just come out when we released that, um, uh, and that that you know. That went to number one uh, in the app store. And th- these were the days when it was less polaroid, polarized. You could um, you could release a kind of an independent game, even though we did end up signing a publishing deal through uh, EA. Um, but back then it was really, you know, uh, content was king. And if you made a good game, it would do well in the charts, regardless if you publish it yourself or someone else publish it. So that game reached number one in like over 100 countries. It was pretty exciting to watch it just kind of go up the charts uh, over the course of, of a few days and then, you know, hang around right. in the number one yeah. position for, for, for several weeks um, in, in, in all kinds of countries in the world and to see people of all languages you know, colors, creeds, and ages uh, in in enjoying the game. That was that was probably our biggest independent success. Um, but we, we had a bunch of um, successes uh, doing uh, games work for hire as well. Obviously, you know, some of the AFL games that we made and the rugby union games were, were well received, even though they were on tight budgets and tight timelines compared to FIFA and you know EA and Two K kind of games uh we did a reboot for whack-a-mole uh for mattel which was a which was a great 3d version of uh, whack-a-mole which was successful in them launching uh, a new line of whack-a-mole toys and then um uh, even more recently uh, the uh, the remaster of um, or the definitive edition as they called it of uh, age of empires 2 which was uh, a personal favorite game of ours that we then got to uh, actually Worked directly with uh, Microsoft, and uh, and that had a very successful release. I think it got like a it's got like a ninety two percent Steam or Metacritic rating uh, or whatever. So uh, we were very happy to see how well received that one was. So there's been there's been a few. Depends depends what your metrics are. Yeah, it all depends. Financial, I mean, uh, we did. Critical. Yeah, I mean, we did Shane Warren, King of Spin, uh, did a mobile app with Daniel, and that went to number one on the charts. Uh, then we did a virtual reality cricket game, um, which uh, was very well received. It was at the MCG Sports Museum. Uh, we did an Intel version where we used a little hardware puck and wrote some Bluetooth code for for Intel. Um, so monetarily, that wasn't great, but... Um, like, again, on time, tight timelines and tight budgets. Well, yeah, we, we, we pushed it through when the funding ran out. Um, and yeah, it, it got shown quite a lot. You know, to have something in a museum was something that I thought was a, a feather in our cap, you okay. know, to have something in a museum, you know. Of, of, of so we got to work with Shane Warren and it was... As, uh, and it was Shane Warren, you know, and, and yeah. Yeah. It, was on t- yeah. it was on TV and, you know, I did, I did a whole lot of interviews on TV about it and things like that. So... Um, I think that was probably the biggest success. And uh, 
people still play it now and still enjoy it. Um, you know, so um, uh, it came out. It would it could have come out much better than it did, but it came out as well as we could it's get. A tight time, on a tight budget. Time. One of the first um, VR yeah. games, out. and that's. Yeah. That's one of those things with game dev is that, you know, a lot of people run out of money or, you know, other people get jobs. You've really got to push to release your game. You can work on it forever. Yeah. You really need to get it out the door. Well, I think know? that's one of the things, like having worked with you guys, that's that's the thing that I didn't realise prior to, like, you know, we started a gaming company and we started it from a marketing perspective. That's my expertise is marketing and my wife. But... Our perception was that making games was pretty simple and you didn't, you know, it wasn't that it was unskilled or anything. Obviously, it's highly skilled. But we sort of thought once you're a game developer, you could just put things together. And I didn't I didn't understand a lot of that side of it, that there's just a, a, a yeah, shit ton I mean, of stuff going on that's behind the scenes. It's, it's like making a, a record or an complex. album yeah, or a movie, you know, if you've got good directors and good actors and, yeah. you know, good set directors or good music producers and, and good musicians, good songwriters, there's a difference between, you know, someone who could write songs and someone who is at the top. And there's a huge difference there. Yeah. So yeah. Um, and think, a lot of that is element. time and effort and a lot of it's natural talent, you know. Um, and well, I've said to Daniel a lot of times, but doing what we do is a privilege. You know, we, we don't take what we do lightly. Um, and that can be the other problem you have, you know. Look at me; I'm a game developer. Um, <laughs> you know, um, you get to have long gray you know, hair and, and <laughs> long gray hair, and, and that's yeah, look okay. like the proof is in the the proof in the pudding. You got to do your release; you got to get it out. Yeah, um, you know. So, I think yeah. there's two Low two points. elements. So you're talking about um, the creative, right? It's a hit based industry. You need to have the secret sauce and what makes a good song, what makes a hit single. There's all these factors. Yeah. The other thing about games is it's just so fucking terribly technical and complicated yeah. at the yeah. end of the day you know yes. like um writing a song you know some some you know the beatles used to record a song in a day uh for example yeah. uh, but you can't make a game in a day you know uh, you, you know you no. kind of ju just kind of can't and i'm not saying that you know it's any easier than making music or, or making a film but by its very nature it's algorithms and maths and numbers and, you know, uh, yes. computer science yes. at, at the end of the day. Well, I think, yeah. that's, that, that, I that think you've hit on something there that, that there is that, 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 um, duology of du that word? Duality. duality, duality, that's dichotomy. The so there's, there's a creative side and then there's a technical side. And if either one of yeah. them is wrong, it fails. And, yeah. and even just getting it balanced is hard. So you've got, to, you've got to make the game good enough and then you've got to have the creative side good enough as well. Yeah, and you need to produce it properly. You know? it's, like, um, it's like an, like, an, like the Apple Mac, you know, there's one in the background here. Steve yeah. Jobs pushed to have beautiful fonts in it and the programmers, no, we can't have it. So then you get those sort of issues as well where, you know, uh, you get the, the program side and the art side, and, you know, they have to meet in the middle and then you have to, you don't have to compromise. If you have a great team, then everyone just flows in with each yeah. other. Yeah. Um, but, you know, they can, it can come undone there. There's lots of places where, you know, the process can come unstuck. So Yeah. Cool. All right. So let's, a lot of people have asked, they want to know more about Wicked Witch. Obviously, that's your, your, your big success, Daniel, where you founded a company and spent, I think one of the stories you told me once was you spent the first four years drunk Having having parties every day and and then Kinda suddenly off. you had a had a successful game and thought shit we better grow up and, yeah. and make a gaming company <laughs> so so, yeah, so tell kinda. me about the tell me about the beginning of that and obviously I've just simplified that into some sort of no, no, story no, um, but uh, no no that's um that's uh, <laughs> that's more or, more or less true so I, I'd worked at a few studios I'd finished college and uh, then I uh, worked at a company called Taurus Games and then I went to a company called Melbourne House which is like a big institution in Australia uh, one of the first game developers in the world by the way 1979 I think um, they, they, they they were formed um, and uh, as a kid I used to buy Melbourne House games so I was very happy to work there and be be a uh, be a programmer 
Um, and then I worked, um, I went, actually went back to Taurus uh, for a few years as a lead programmer and a producer. And then at some point, um, I just, uh, I'd always been making video games. So I had the idea to, to start our own studio. And back in the day, and this is kind of before there was an indie scene, but we were very much an indie game developer. And um, and yeah, uh, you know, we were living the dream at the start. We were uh, we were making games on contract and making original titles, and we could make our own hours. Um, uh, we could have some beers in the in in the office if we want. We could take a break and play World of Warcraft, which was you know when, when the beta of that came out. Um, and it was I often say it was more like a club. Than a game studio at the start, you know, uh, it was friends uh, and people people we knew and uh, other veterans from the industry. It was only a handful of us working out of a, a two bedroom unit uh, making video games. Uh, we had a client in the UK. Uh, we, we used to upload making Game Boy games at the start. We used to upload our our games via a bulletin board because the internet was new at that yeah. time. Uh, basically, uh, <laughs> we said. Uh, Put, put our ROMs uh, up there when Windows 95 and Windows 98 uh, kind of uh, just started. And so for many years, we were kind of, yeah, we didn't take ourselves that seriously. We were kind of just passion driven and, you know, a bunch of like minded um, guys uh, working together. Uh, and then, as you say, you know, we started, then we started making games for Telstra uh, on mobile phones and we started making games for the AFL. And then somewhere along the line, you know, uh, we, uh, you know, we, we got more work and, and more clients. We went from, you know, seven people to 12 people to 15 people to 20 people. Uh, and then we realized that we were a legitimate business <laughs> and that we, you know, we needed some structure and we needed some, probably some discipline and, you know, you can't live forever, you know, um, working all hours of the day or work on the weekends uh, yeah. or whatever. Yeah. And you have to have employees and then you need to do accounting and then you got to, you know, do your taxes and all that kind of thing. And uh, it kind of became, became a real thing. And um, it kind of just went from strength to strength, really. There were some ups and downs, um, you know, um, the global financial crisis. Uh, I think we were like, you know, maybe 30 people at that point. And we had to downsize back down to like a dozen people, um, uh, even with even before before COVID. Um, you know, um, you know, we we were up to like 50 or 60 people, and we had we had to downsize uh, again and kind of roll with the punches and you know uh, keep keep the machine going and uh, you know doing work for hire, uh, doing original original titles, um, and, and learning how to learning how to run run. Uh, a, a, a big, a big business, but uh, you know, in the end, um, we grew. I think in our peak, we were eighty something people. We'd become the largest, um, you know, independent Australian-owned games company. Uh, there were there were a few others are, are, are around, but it was always a uh, you know dependent uh, who who was doing uh, what at the time. Everyone was upsizing and downsizing, but um, yeah. know, there were some times uh, we were on the board of the Game Developers Association of Australia. We're working with universities. We're educating you know TAFEs and sh help sh helping shape courses and you know giving talks and um, you know um, helping out with on government roundtables to facilitate you know, uh, policy for funding within the industry. And uh, yeah, it kind of, uh, it all kind of um, uh, escalated. Um, and then we did learn lots of, lots of lessons uh, during that time. Um, you know, uh, again, uh, you know, uh, it was built with friends uh, and family and, uh, and other veterans from the industry um, that I knew. And uh, some of my friends um, came on as advisors, friends from high school, friends from college, friends from the industry. Um, and, you know, um, we learned a lot. We learned that accounting is important, <laughs> for example. I was never great, uh, a great accountant. Um, uh, actually, the way I learned to run a business was from SimCity. Uh, that's, that's where I learned. <laughs> that's where I learned what a balance sheet was. It's right. lucky I that's don't what, have to have that as my my. I can't. That, that's I, where I learned. I've I've never completed a game of SimCity. I can't get it past the whatever that's stage. It. <laughs> but that terrible. was it. Like uh, like I was a programmer and a game maker. I wasn't a business uh, businessman. Uh, so it was really me being the CEO and the managing director was really a means to it end to to for us to get our creative outlet. Um, so you know uh, we learned lots of le lessons. I mean scaling up. You know. Um, uh, one of my advisors, a good friend of mine, you know, said, hey, we need to get good at running at 20 people. 
yeah. and then we need to get good at running at 50 people and then we need to get good at running at 100 people at the time you know we were we were pretty brazen and pretty arrogant and probably a bit naive and a bit too confident we just took it on we're like ah she'll be right well yeah we'll just hire more people and run 50 people run a 50 well, person studio well that's a really interesting point because one of the biggest lessons i learned in life was this there's there's two diametrically opposed actions that happen in, in with men and it's men because all the studies have been done on men but the first one is that most men, Napoleon Hill, who wrote the book Thin Grow Rich, said most men never achieve anything of significance before 40, All right, which is a really yeah. interesting... We spend most of our time chasing women and, and partying. So that's, that's men, all right? And the, the diametrically opposed thing is that um, the most creative time of your life is pre-30. So um, when you're a genius, like Einstein and, and those guys... Th- what if they haven't written their life work by 30, they almost never do. Very rarely does someone in their older years go on and do world-changing things. So there's that diametrically opposed two forces operating. That you've got to have youth and, and, and um, a lack of fear to take on yes. tasks you would never do when you're older. Like, you know, yeah. and that's why being in business with my two sons... It's, it's easier to scale out and try... I mean, I'm obviously the entrepreneur and the, the risk taker and Jet, in a lot of ways, is the, the more conservative one. But he's still youthful and, and still looks at things with, well, what's the worst that could happen here? Which is something that you lose as you get older because you can imagine you some pretty what, bad worse. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. No, that's yeah. right. I often think if I started a business now, if I if I would take the same risks and uh, you know, um, I know yeah, I would, and, uh, you know, no bet, bet bet the farm. You you would or uh, you wouldn't now. both. I, I I wouldn't because you realise um, how close you came. Yeah. To uh, every time you know, it, uh, you get you, you get pushed down when you've got you know when you're young, you just dust yourself off and off you go again. But when you're older, you've got a little bit more to lose. You know, you get a little get bit a lot more, more comfortable. Than. Yeah. But that said, you're also a lot smarter in your decisions. You know, you've got a lot more information to pull on. Um, so Mate, we we didn't we we couldn't be stopped. We 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 took on anything. We 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 didn't care. Yeah, yeah, we didn't that's right. Stopped. I'll do that. We'll I'll do that. Like, we'll, I'll yeah, do we'll that. Just like, bring it on. We'll, we'll take it. Yeah, we'll do it. We'll yeah. work all day, all night for weeks on end. Yeah. It's like yeah. it was like yeah. yeah. Uh, to a world standard as well. We saw the games that are coming out. We're like, we can fucking do that. You know, um, let's, you know, uh, we want to be the best. We were, we were motivated, driven by excellence. Uh, we knew we knew we could do it. It's a bit of an Aussie, a bit of an Aussie way as well, I think. Like, you know, just, yeah. um, you know, a bit, bit of elbow well, grease, bit of hard work, um, you know, uh, be, still be honest that, with yourself and just, we do it, just except we get do it into smarter, it. You know, we, we still do now, that. Now, now we do. Yeah. Part of running companies is understanding that you got you got to know exactly who you are and what stage of life you're in and then what do I need to fill in the parts I can't do? And if if you're the sort of boss that just is forever scared someone's going to do something better than you, then you're fucked because I actually, my, my whole, the whole reason I hired you, Daniel, was because you knew more than me. That's what, that's what I needed. There was no use me trying to tell you what to do. I need someone who knows much more about video games than me to stop me making the mistakes that I would have gone on to Absolutely. make had I tried to do this myself. You know, so I used to hire but programmers yeah. who were who were better than me. Like I, yeah, uh, yeah. In, in the same way, I was like, "There's a programmer that um, knows, you know, yeah, knows knows yeah. more than me. Knows he's got more than me. maths. He's got he's, he's got yeah, better experience." That's and uh, we always well, we... Looked, looked for that. We we ne- um, you know, in our mission uh, and values uh, statements. Uh, we didn't want any egos. We didn't, you know, we wanted a collaborative share. If someone was was good, you, you know, you need that. You you want to you want to harness that. You yeah. get to a point yeah. where you know e- e- ego doesn't really matter <laughs> anymore, and success is more important. And you end up uh, investing in people at the end of the day. I think that's right. And I mean, ego is a young man's game as well. You know, um, exactly. That's why the guy, you know, our team at the moment, it's almost a flat management, you know. Everyone is an A player, they bounce off each other, um, you know. 
everyone just gets in there and does what's required. When if everyone was younger, you know, or you had a young boss who wants to, you know, enjoys being the boss and telling people what to do. I don't want to be the smartest guy in the room, you know. I just want to do what I'm good at and uh, leave the yeah. other guys to do what they're good at. So, well, I think that's I think that's um, something that most people probably don't know about what we've done is that when the GG team, when Daniel said, okay, well, to fix this problem you've got, we're going to need to put together an elite team of guys that don't need to be managed, who wake up in the morning and when I say, I need this done, that's all I need to say because they know how to do it. They know what to do. They've done it a hundred times before and you've built a team probably for the first time in your, in your career that is literally just the best of the best. So yeah, that's, right. that's how you've achieved what you've achieved in such a short period of time. Yeah, at, at with which, you know, um, it, I mean, it was a lot larger. There was like, you know, there was like 80 plus people. So we were bringing in juniors. Uh, we had training regimes. We had mentorship and people would move up from junior to mid-level. Uh, we still, uh, we always had that veteran thing as well, kind of one third each, one third juniors, one third mids and one third veterans. Yeah. Um, but when, when, you know, uh, when we were analyzing the challenges for, for playable and, and what needed to be done and where Glinda Games wanted to go, um, we, we realized that, uh, you know, <laughs> there's really no replacement for experience uh, at, yep. at, at the end of the day. So uh, to have a lean and well, mean it's a short, team. It's a shortcut, isn't it? Veterans, oh, the experience uh, yeah. is a shortcut. Every, every, every veteran is worth, you know, three to five juniors, you know what I mean? Like, so it's just, um, yeah, a, a way you can, get more, more, more done. Um, yeah. uh, with less red tape, uh, especially when you need to be agile, you need to be quick and you know, the market's moving quickly and you know, you guys have got an aggressive um, a, a, a agenda of things that need to be done. And so, you know, that's, um, that's what fit the bill. I think. So just to finish up on Wicked Witch, so where did Wicked Witch end up? So you obviously, you, you started off as a group of guys having fun. That's right. You ended in up the up garage. We started in the garage. Demand. Yep. And then you end That's up right. with a contract with Microsoft running Age of Empires yeah. for them. So where does Wicked Witch right. end up? Where, you obviously don't run it now, so why? Um, right, so look, uh, you know, uh, it was 20, 20 years. Uh, it was almost, it was just after our 20th year anniversary. There was a lot of blood, sweat and tears uh, in that, um, not only by me, but also by my, my colleagues. Uh, a lot of sacrifices, a lot of hard work, you know, six days a week, 12, 12 hours a day for for 20 odd years. A lot of ups and downs, like I said, GFC, COVID, uh, multiple uh, times between projects. Lots of up and up, yeah. ups and downs. Um, uh, you know, uh, we'd gotten ourselves into a position where we were had some kind of blue chip clients, like um, working with the publisher with, with the AFL, with Rugby Union. Uh, we'd had some mobile successes. We're working with uh, Microsoft on Age of Empires. Uh, we'd entered into some contracts with Warner Brothers, and things were on an upward curve. And then it really came to, almost down to a personal decision. Like I found myself, um, uh, I got, I started Wicked Witch because I love video games and I'm passionate about video games and yeah. I, I enjoy making them. And I was a programmer at the start. And then I realised I was really just doing accounting uh, and um, and managing, <laughs> Running a business. managing a business. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And somewhere along the line without me quite noticing that, that just changed uh, and shifted into that. And if I'm being perfectly honest, you know, it wasn't as uh, enjoyable uh, uh, at, at, that, at that point. And there was a part of me that wanted to get back to the creative side of things. Um, so, you know, um, uh, things were heating up with our work that we had done with government, with the digital games tax offset and, uh, th and things like that. Things were kind of heating up. Uh, in Melbourne, uh, and there were people looking looking to buy studios, and so it was an opportunity. It was an opportunity. It was an opportunity um, to have a bit of a reset, to kind of cash in on 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 the hard work that we had done for myself and for for my colleagues, um, uh, and then also to take a step back uh, and then do something new uh, as well. You know, do something, get back to what I was interested in, get back to you know, new technologies and exciting spaces uh, within yeah. the industry um, that, you know, had, um, by being smaller and agile uh, again. So, so yeah, we were acquired um, in the end. Uh, after a year of negotiation, we were acquired by a company called Keywords, uh, which is an international uh, organization, which is very aggressive uh, in expanding. Um, they saw Melbourne as a real hotspot, as, as did multiple other 
um, companies. Uh, and so, yeah, yeah you know, uh, opportunity knocks. Uh, we 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 took it. Uh, we split the company in two. We kept all the IP and the technology and things like that. And they took the name and the processes and the people. And um, and yeah, we um, yeah, we got to have a bit of a win uh, and uh, and prepare ourselves for for the next chapter, basically. Mm, all right. How's that for an answer? That's, that's a good um, answer. So here's, um, here's the next question. I think it's fair to say that you guys are the true OG, old guard, gaming developing type people in the world. Oh, well, what? there are guys. Uh, gaming's like, um, I don't know, like he, he mentioned the Beatles before. I mean, there are guys like Sid Meier. The guys like John John Carmack and John Romero from id Software, you know, they're they're, they're superstars. But um, we certainly know what we're doing. I mean, uh, my studio Oceanic, um, uh, Glinda's made up of guys um, who are from Oceanic Studios and and guys from Wicked Witch. Uh, so you know, it's uh, everyone's worked together before, which I think uh, is part of the um, is part of the secret sauce as well. So, yeah. Um, you know, well, yeah, when you've got that, like any relationship, any group of friends, any team, when you've got that respect for each other and you know how to work together without stepping on everyone's toes, like Amanda and I, if you watched Amanda and I work together, you'd be surprised, I think, with some of the discussions we have backwards and forwards where her, her, latest, her latest term for me today was, you don't have to be a cuntosaurus. And I'm like, a what? And so she's just made up a whole new word to just explain how she feels when I'm sort of pushing something one way and she wants to come back the other way. And, you know, I think teams do get that really nice gel when you know we, each other. We always, said, we always said we were like a family, you know. My, my wife worked in the business. My daughters worked in the business. We had friends from the industry. My brother was the, uh, the, the bookkeeper uh, or, and, and whatever. So, you know. Friends and family uh, makes a pretty strong, strong bond. Uh, yeah. When you're together. yeah, I agree. It comes comes with its challenges as well. Don't you? So when yeah, so you, when you think you about have to balance it, yeah. Sorry, you, go have, on. you have to you have to balance. Everyone needs to know that they're in it for you know the right reasons, you know, because um, you can get or someone who um, uh, can just destroy the whole team. Um, you know, like I mentioned before, it, it's a privilege, not a right to be able to make games. Yeah. Um, so. Well, I think that's a really good attitude. So from this OG perspective where you, you guys have come in with all this experience, there's obviously against crypto, there's a very big wall that some gamers have that you can't bring crypto to gaming. It's going to wreck gaming. How come you guys have come across and decided to put your, your hat in the ring and say, you know what? There could be something here. Yeah, look, um, I'll, I'll, I'll start with that. Um, um, I've always been interested in um, emerging technologies. Uh, Bo and Oceanic Studios uh, in, in the same way. Um, we've, we have, we've, done, we've done everything, you know, uh, over, over the years, whether it was, uh, you know, the dawn of console gaming, whether it was the dawn of smartphone gaming, whether it was the dawn of virtual reality, whether it was a uh, real money uh, and skill based uh, gaming. As far as I'm concerned, you know, uh, if you don't keep up to date, uh, then you're, you're going to be dead, dead in, in the water. So for me, it's an exciting space. Uh, you know, I remember um, playing Ultima Online, uh, you know, back back in the early noughties, um, and people used to sell their items to each other via like eBay or via personal messages. And they would trade items and sell items for real, real money, uh, which is full of risk. You transfer someone money and they'd have to meet you in the game and they'd have to give you, give you their yeah. bloody, you know, green no. special armor that had dropped for, from a boss or whatever, um, you know, um, blizzard with their auction house, uh, and, and whatnot. And then you see, you know, um, uh, microtransactions uh, and uh, you know, uh, and in-app purchases and things like that. So, as far as I'm concerned, um, it's a natural evolution. Uh, crypto yep. makes a lot of sense. To own your items has been something that I think the games industry every has gamer has wanted. Been, yeah. 
exactly You've been skirting around it uh, the whole time and you know the technology uh, you know it's obviously not going away it's new um it's uh, a, a exciting it offers lots of possibilities so part of glinda games mission statement is to you know um is to be in the now to be uh, in the future to embrace new technologies and to see where they go and to see what they have to offer because i think if you don't do that and you resist new things and new trends well then eventually you'll be a dinosaur and dead yeah. in the water so that's I mean, right so you're sitting there asking to, uh, what, the, what the fuck happened yeah. yeah you uh you don't want to uh run to where the the footy has been you want to run to where it's going absolutely so that's, you, so, that's so australian yeah. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's so Aussie. A footy. Well, you do, and you know, and, and you can jump on stuff yeah, early, like and you know, and you can, yeah, you, you can see where it's going to go. You know, um, I could do American. You know, you don't want to skate where the puck has been. You want to. Wanna well, that was Wayne Gretzky, the, the the famous yeah. hockey player. They actually that's did right. a study on him to find out how he did it, because yeah, that's right. He never went where the puck was. He just skated yeah. away from everyone. And they go, yeah. where's he off to? Oh, and then the puck's over there. And he's, yeah, he's like, it's not that they passed it to him. He could actually, and they actually found out, it's actually a psychological thing. It's called third, um, third vision or something. So you've got first vision where you can see where you're looking. You've got second vision where you can see where someone else is looking from. And then you've got third right. vision, which you can see the whole, the whole ice ring from the, from the, That's right. and in his brain, he spent a lot of time in third vision observing from above the ice ring and he could see where the play would go so which is exactly it. what this is and because you don't need your ball coin to buy the game you get the game you play it if you want to uh get some of your own stuff you can but it doesn't impact the game yeah. you have to be good at it regardless um you know and and you get to own it i mean if you if you download an app on your phone or some music on your phone, it's all digital. You don't have the physical record. There's really no difference in it. I think it's like any new technology. People are are, are afraid of it. Some people embrace it, um, and a whole lot of people have no idea until they do, and then it's it's too late. So um, if it wasn't going to be anything, it wouldn't be anything, and it's as simple as that. Yeah. So. That's very profound, Bo. Jesus. <laughs> deep, yeah. deep. gosh. We need to drink yeah. some more. Yeah, if, if I wasn't convinced. Um, you know, and, it's, and it's, 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 a, it's that early um, adopter thing, yeah. you know? It's like, um, you know, we, we've done VR for almost 10 years now, you know, and people still try and go, oh, this is amazing. I've never seen this before, you know? Um, you know, people said the iPhone. You know, they said, um, who's the Steve Ballmer from Microsoft? You know, doesn't have a keyboard, you know, doesn't do this and it doesn't do that. You know, Blackberry came out of, came out of nowhere and they suddenly, they were gone, you know, so. The people that said girls, the, inter the you know? internet itself was just a fad. Oh, and computers. Yeah. Like the, the yeah. head of IBM yeah. said yeah. there was no need for more than six computers in the whole world. That, <laughs> you know, that people, was the head of IBM, like, you know, so yeah. Like people's. People, like people the, still the, treat gaming as a as a kids as a, as a kids thing, even though it makes more money than Hollywood. Even though the average gamer is now our age, um, you know, it's 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 a much more powerful medium than a lot of those things because yeah. you're inside the narrative. VR is the same; you're actually inside the game. You know, um, and crypto is another one of those things. You know, it's 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 if I buy a game and I. You know, it's better than loot boxes because everyone has the same loot box and you don't own that and you can't trade that and you can't do anything with that, you know, um, and it's contained somewhere else which you don't have access to. Um, yeah. So I think it's, it's, it, it's the right way to do it. Yeah. Cool. All right. So there's a question for you, Bo. You were brought, Daniel actually grabbed you and said, you're coming with me to America to look at the... The Revan team. Yes. And this is not a, a a dump on Revan. That's not the idea. Of this. I just I just want to make it clear to everyone who's involved with our community. Can you just explain in simple terms what happened there? Like you, we a lot of people don't understand that we went to America to help 
them fix the game because the game was not yes. working. The game was not going to make it the way it was. So can yes, you just explain right. what happened when you turned up and then just a brief overview? Uh, so uh, we turned up um, and a lot of the team went there and we went, oh, that's a bit strange. Yeah, so you've got a 12-person uh, team yeah. and there were how many there? Three, maybe. Three yeah. out of 12. And we were like, well, you better get them down here. Um, and I can understand the point of view um, because the team is young and when you're young, you know, you think you know everything. Um, but we did say to them, hey, we're here to help. We've made all the mistakes in the world. Uh, we're here to, to tell you, you know, don't do this, don't do that. Do it this way. We've got to release the game. Um, we'll help you in any way that we can. We suggest that you do A, B, C, D. Um, you know, even small things like uh, with their office, you know, um, paint the walls, get a big whiteboard, you know, put a couch in the corner, make it a place for people to come and, you know, hang. want yep. to work out of and hang out and all the rest of it. Um, you know, uh, these are the things you should be doing with your game. You should optimize it to work on low GPUs, um, you know, because yeah, it works great on a 3080, so it should. Um, you know, you should dial this back, you should dial that back. You know, there's, there's no harm in admitting that you've done the wrong thing. There's no harm in starting again. And we're here to help. We've got a team, we can help you guys out. Um, and essentially they went the opposite direction and said, you guys don't know what you're doing. Even though we said, hey, we've released 200 games between us. Uh, you guys haven't released one. At some well, point, we know for me, that what was, we're doing. That was the real turning point when you guys got on a phone call to me and said, Jono, we've told them to do this, this and this, and they're just ignoring us. And that was, for me, the first time I thought, shit, we're in, we're in real trouble because if well, they're not going to listen when to the Daniel experts... And I turned around and I remember standing in Marquette on that main street and I turned down and I said, well, fuck it. Let's just make it ourselves. We know we can do it uh, and we know we can make it better. Um, you know, these guys... Are taking the piss they're taking the money they're not listening to us this is an awesome opportunity for anyone and they don't want it so they wanted it they would do what the publisher is asking them to do and they would also take the help of veterans but again they were young and this is a lesson that they have to learn yeah they won't do it a second time um but yeah, they probably think, won't get another right. chance it was very much a, those chances very are very much a rare. case of very much a case of you we, we struggled to put a you know old head on young shoulders, you know. Really, uh, I think. You know, you yeah, know, they, we did say to them, they, they you don't know what you don't know. Green. You know. They they hadn't seen the pitfalls. They hadn't, like you, like you said, Bert. They hadn't uh, learned from. They hadn't learned failed. from their mistakes and things like that. It was their first game, just out of uni, and um, and you know where you know and uh, making games is serious business, especially you know, with what playable is uh, trying to achieve. And um, unfortunately, at the end of the day, uh, it was our conclusion that um, the inexperience meant they really weren't up up to the task, unfortunately. Yeah, and, and, yeah. and, and time is money and you can't walk around, you know, going, like I said before, it's a privilege. You can't walk around going, look at me, I'm a game developer. You've got to ship it, move on to the second one, the third one, the fourth one. Well, if I, you don't hate your first version, you're doing something wrong. Yeah. So. Well, I think that's, I think one of the things that stood out for me, Bo, was when, when you were talking to me in one of the calls in that time, and you said, Daniel and I have spent our whole lives literally worrying about next month's bills. Because when you're a game developer, that's how it is. You, you, you got a whole group of people to pay. The money's coming in lump sums and not week to week. And yeah. crypto allows a very interesting change in that where we can actually make the game, the, the money flow more regularly and give you a chance to just be game devs and not have to try and be business yeah, people. And, correct. Which yeah. is what, I mean, we, we have to do a little bit because we still have our own company, but we don't have to chase the work and do yep. a job for this amount of money and then do another one for this amount of money and then yep. burn all that money and then you know your focus is all over the place if you know it's done you've got your budget you can just you can just focus on making a game exactly what you said all yep. of those uh all of those extraneous uh stresses go away so 
And we we could see it. It was like it was it was like black and white to us, you know. Um, you know, um, they were no, no, nice enough guys uh, uh, um, and girls who were uh, working together, and they 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 meant well and everything. But um, they just uh, massively underestimated uh, the 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 task at hand. Uh, at, yeah. at hand, so, uh, no, no, really no, no one had, been worked, no one had worked in a game studio. No one had shipped a game, and um, That's right. yeah. It was just, um, they had a, a guy was, doing uh, it around the soundtrack for six months, and it's like, well, that's great, but yeah. you know, that, that's a luxury that you don't have. You know? Well, Daniel, yeah, I think that's you... one, of your, one of your sayings, isn't it? It's um, the last 10% of the game is 50% of the work. Oh, uh, oh absolutely. 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 And that, and that you know, and I learned that because I had mentors. I had, when I first worked, I worked in a few different game studios, and I had mentors and people that were senior to me uh, that had the experience, and they passed. They passed on some of that experience, and then I learned firsthand by working on those projects and then running my own projects. Uh, and you know that was years and years of, uh, of of experience and making mistakes and learning and having some wins and having some losses. Um, and unfortunately, you know um, this this team just just didn't have that experience. And uh, you know, uh, unfortunately, uh, it just really wasn't at the um, the standard that uh, playable games needed. No, because you know you can't you can't release something that isn't. Well, if you know. if we do, we just condemn ourselves to another crypto company, and that's that's not our goal. Our goal is to release a game that, I mean, I, I've said from the very beginning, I don't need to have the best game ever made, but we do need to have a game that when you play it, you can appreciate that a it's been built well, and b it's fun to play. And as long as we achieve those two things and have the crypto side, we're going to have a really successful game. That's exactly right. So that's, and we're all about making yeah. great games. So, and we cool. know how to do it and we've done it before. So. so you've been involved in bringing to market 200 plus games between the pair of you. How would you rate Nexus out of those 200 games? So I'll start by saying that, um, there's only been a handful of times in, in my career where I've been working on games um, and before it's finished, you can tell that there's something special. I can I can remember them clearly uh, because they're, they're those kind of moments. It's like Fantastic. creating a song when you, yeah, when you go, oh, there's a, a good riff, there's a good hook, and you yeah. get this early. Even before the thing's finished, you know there's something there. Um, yeah. I had it once um, in high school, making a 3D game with uh, with spaceships. Uh, and all my friends and family, we kept even before it was finished, we kept playing it. We kept playing it. I was like, why out of all the games that I've made, is everyone just playing this game that's not finished? Because there was inherently something fun and something kind of addictive uh, and yeah. accessible uh, about it. Yeah. Uh, we had it with Catapult King as well, uh, even right off the, off the first prototype. Uh, and when we sold it to, uh, when we, sorry, when we made the agreement with EA to publish it, we showed them an early version and within 15 minutes, um, they signed up as a publisher because it just had something good about it. Something yeah, got, fun. Got, and, so, and sometimes it's... it's and sorry, sometimes no, it's... I, quantifiable i said to daniel the other day there are there's a um there's a kart racing game made by uh nickelodeon there's one by disney there's one by sega a sonic one there's one by ride that little youtube dude there are dozens but you pick up mario kart and you play it and there's something about it that feels right all the other ones they're off by a little bit I don't know why they just don't copy it. I don't know why. I don't know why. But yeah. they're all they, they do. They you do know? copy. They even do copy it. They can't. Well, they're overcomplicated. Like on, or, pa- on know, paper, like... on paper, it's the same kind of thing. Correct. Right? You know, but, those but reality, Nintendo's very good at, at, yeah. at that at that secret source. You know, and That's Nexus true. has that. You pick it up and you play it, and it's smooth and it glides, and you can understand, and everything makes sense, and you know, and there's no long tutorials and there's no extraneous, you know, screens and there's no little cards that you collect and there's no little boxes that you have to log in four days in a row to get. There's none of that. You get in there, you play it like Quake, you know, like, you know, you yes. get in there, Doom. you get in there, action yeah. starts, away you go. And you're only as good as you are. So 
And so it, it really does. It. Have out, out, of, out of the hundred, two hundred games that I've made, there's only been a handful that you that, yeah. that felt good off the bat uh, and have uh, had that secret secret sauce. Um, and uh, I think it was you know uh, a few months into development uh, on Nexus on our on our version, we realised that, um, that that there was, there was just something fun and something accessible uh, about it. And uh, and it wasn't just me who felt it; uh, we all felt it. The whole team kind of felt it. We're like, hey. We're we're on we're onto something here, uh, you know. Uh, as long as we don't fuck it up <laughs> and we keep making it, making right. it better, because because you can overproduce a song sometimes. You can change. You can have too many producers, yeah. whatever. That's as long right. As you I'm being very cool careful to, about to that. Score. So um, yeah, so uh, yeah, definitely Nexus is um, off off to a, a really strong uh, start uh, for, for for sure. And now that we're you know uh, coming in. At the end of development, and like you said, John, you know, um, we're not, uh, we're not EA, uh, and we're we're not Ubisoft, uh, right? We're 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 um, competing in in a different um, uh, echelon uh, of, of of game development, but uh, you know, um, sometimes you have indie successes, and sometimes you just uh, strike upon something that's fun, and I think it's. You know, a testament to the Glinda Games team in the way we've all kind of come together. Uh, yeah. We know what the what what, what, what the mission is. Uh, we know what works and we know what doesn't from some of our um, experience. That's uh, right. And Nexus yeah. um, seems to just have all, all the ingredients so far. Yeah. I mean, we have one meeting a week. We never have meetings about meetings and we don't obsess. You know, we just go, right, what are we going to do? Yep, that's great. Whack it in. Te- yep, that, that works well. Right. Let's move on. You know, and you can get, you know, Tony Hawk 5 uh, is an example. They spent a lot of money on that, and it's one of the worst games ever. So having money in a big team doesn't necessitate no, it doesn't you make, make a great, great game. game. But, you know, it's, well, um, look at look at New World. Like, what did Amazon spend yeah, on? Yeah. Right. I think that was $400 million, right. You know, yeah. and it just right. was... They, yeah, it was just, just disaster. All right. So we're in the year this year we've been given the gift of AI. So how do you guys think AI is going to impact gaming and what do you think? Like, obviously, I'm a very big advocate of being on the cutting edge and we're going to definitely move that way. But how do you see um, AI impacting gaming as, and, and, and making it better or worse? As- when people ask me about AI, this is the answer that I give them. Um, I've been legitimately excited by technology um, three times uh, during my 30-year career. The first one was probably when the internet came out. Uh, When the internet came out, it was a revolution. It was going to change the world, and you could see it, and you could see the potential. The second one was probably uh, touchscreen smartphones. When they came out, you could see they were going to change uh, the way everybody lived and the way everybody worked. It was, it was a revolution. Uh, and not since those two things have I felt the same way as I felt when I first started playing around with AI tools about a year ago with Stable Diffusion and, and ChatGPT. Yep. Uh, I was excited, uh, a little bit scared, uh, and, and, and blown away. And I, uh, and I think it's the, the biggest shift uh, that I've seen in, in technology uh, in yeah, uh, since since the smartphone, uh, it's going to change the way we all live. It's going to change the way we all work. Uh, and you know, like cryptocurrency and emerging technology, we've talked about. If you don't embrace it uh, and use it and get on board, uh, you're going to be left behind uh, in a shorter time than anybody realizes. So that's a way I feel about AI. We're using it on an almost daily basis uh, already uh, and we're just scratching the surface yeah 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 I, I would tend to agree i mean for the average person it'll permeate through their life and they won't have ever have to do anything or interact with it it'll just be there in the background which yeah. i think i mean alexis that googles that depends how you want to term the word artificial intelligence um you know things like chat gpt and, and mid journey they're unbelievable um, as a as a time Absolutely astounding saver, um, but you still have to understand what it's the question you want to pose to it, and then understand the output um, to have any value out yeah. of it. Um, 
I don't see any difference between going to the library and getting out an encyclopedia like I used to do and copying it down or asking chat GPT. You still need to read it and understand it. I think so, there's a difference in speed. So I'm, I'm using it to do a bit of writing difference. at the moment. And um, I, I write shit quite a bit. And what I'm finding amazing is being able to change tone. So yeah. I can't write in certain tones. And you don't have to use the Dewey Decimal System. This is true. <laughs> and and what, what was what was that stupid fucking thing they had the the blue the the blue fish thing? Yeah. What, what were they? Yeah, exactly. Microfish. 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 Yeah. Oh yeah, my god! Did I hate them? Uh-huh. Oh yeah. No. Go to the library and and go to the microfish and look up the newspapers from 1927, yeah. and they were all uh-huh. stored on that damn microfish thing, and you could. Oh. Wouldn't you go straight to the National Geographic, Daniel? <laughs> To see. I had to, mate. I had to. There was nothing. There was nothing there. It was like three books that I wanted. Oh, yeah. I had to go to the reference section. But now, um, you know, in contrast, we've got um, the sum of all humanity's uh, knowledge and information uh, yes. uh, at, at, at the click of a button, more or less. Well, yeah. I, pretty, I put in. I put in the chat GTP the other week. I, I wrote a like a. We've got. We're about to approach influencers to play, to play um, like Nexus. And I um, wrote out a, 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 what I thought was a pretty good introductory, hello, this is who we are, this is what we're looking for, et cetera. And then I said to ChatGTP, could you write me one that's serious? Based on what I've written, can you write me one that's serious? Can you write me one that's lighthearted? Can you write me one that's humorous? And all three were amazing. It was just like, pretty... wow. And Elon Musk just said a couple of days ago, you know, that ChatGTP is now writing better than 99% of your humans. So, like, Absolutely. it's in, in what? Is that three or four months since it got released to the public? Like, it's, it's a really short, six months maybe? It's a really short yeah. period of time. So, right. it's pretty exciting. And I'm, I'm hanging. I mean, I don't think AI will be here that long. I actually think it's going to go. I think it's going to realise that it's much smarter than us and it's going to say, I'm off. <laughs> It's going to fly to Mars and send It'll just send, it, send itself somewhere at the speed of light, yeah. <laughs> All right, so to finish off, um, where do you think we're going to end up? Like we're, we're obviously in, like for you guys, this is your first year with Playable Games. For me, it's my second year with Playable Games. But um, where do you see us getting to, like obviously the money's going to come next bull run. This well, We're in the bull run now. But as we move into the, the depth of it where the actual... We, our coin price goes up, our nodes start selling again, we're now capitalised. Where do you see the sort of games we're going to be able to build and what we've got to offer in the future? I see a massive opportunity for Playable Games. Uh, part of the reason that we enjoy working with Playable Games and why we uh, are, are making this content together is because this is a new emerging uh, technology, a new emerging space call it Web3, call it, uh, you know, uh, crypto, call it what whatever you want. Um, but, um, you know, this is, this, is, this is the future. I think there's a real opportunity for playable games to release quality content um, that, that people want to play uh, and that, you know, uh, embraces these new technologies in a, in a seamless and usable uh, fashion. Uh, a lot of people are trying, a lot of people are failing, some people are getting it right. Um, it's, uh, it, it's new and I think, uh, uh, you know, our experience uh, teamed with your uh, experience uh, is, um, is setting us up for a really exciting, really exciting future where, you know, uh, where people who love video games and love technology uh, are going to see the marriage of, of, of all these things delivered in a uh, in a, a great source of entertainment. How yeah, I would agree. I, I think quote, that quote, <laughs> quote me on that. <laughs> I think I, I think I didn't even I didn't even rehearse it. Just... I didn't even rehearse that. I just it's made that up that. on the spot. That's, that's it. That's how I feel, man. That's a, that's a absolute absolutely yeah, right. how I feel. We wouldn't be here. We wouldn't be passionate about it if we didn't if we didn't fully believe it. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I would agree. I think the games are going to transcend the crypto and the crypto would transcend the games. I well, think crypto should be become invisible. So crypto Correct. should just be there, just like... I think, 
just people just will be like, surprised that it's a crypto game, and people will be surprised that crypto makes yeah. it makes the game. It's like just this. another payment method, right? At the end it, of the day, to be it, honest, it's a it's a it's way right. it's a way to get involved with ownership, and it should have no impact on the game whatsoever. So, like, in, not in just another game. payment method, a, a better, a better yeah. payment method. Yeah. Yeah, and it's I mean, like, it, you know, it, someone said the other day, oh, yeah, none of the big companies will embrace it because they're going to lose too much money, but they don't even understand the mathematics of it. Like, they don't understand yeah, there's two like, billion new gamers coming, and they're all coming for crypto. They're not coming for gaming. Gamers right, have had you know, years to ca- capture the world market. I mean, the two billion people coming are coming for crypto gaming because they're excited right. about combining the two. You know, so yeah. it's... Um, I mean, where's, where, where's Kodak, you know? I mean, exactly. these things come along. They were the best. They were the best. It's 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 that it's that generation that embrace it that don't know anything else. You know, this is the way. Well, why would you do it the other way? Why would you have Disruptive. cash in your pocket? Disruptive. Why would you walk into a bank? I don't have time for that. Yeah. You know? Oh well, look what so, happened with the horse and carriage when when Ford released the car. They they had they they put a law in place, which in some places in the world is still in place, that you had to run in front of the car. You had to have a person run in front of the car with a red flag. That's where there's too many red flags. That saying comes from. Um, yeah, don't, right, right. don't get bogged down with red flags. So the idea was that the, the politicians of the time put that in place to slow the cars down, so they couldn't go faster than carriages. Yeah, because I mean, it's like electric cars. People go, oh no, the you know. It's never going to happen. But you get someone like Elon Musk who has yeah. enough money to not be swayed by political stuff, doesn't yeah. care, I'm going to do this, and it's done. So and not only done, but done better same thing. than anyone ever dreamed of, yeah. That's right, because there's no red flags yeah. for him. You just run him over. That's it. See you later. It's like, uh, you know, he just leapfrogs him. Goes to the side. Yeah, if anyone across. wants to deny technology, like what kind of a, what kind of a game is that? Why, why? I mean, you can place your bets, and some will come, or some will go. But at the end of the day, you know, technology is changing the world we live in, and uh, to be a part of it is, you know, pretty exciting. Well, but it, it, it has it, to, you know, when they three D print meat, that'll get rid of all of those issues that we have. Electric cars, you know, human humans are. As much as people don't think we are, we're very good at bettering ourselves and making the the world's in the best shape it's ever been. Yeah, you know, if you want to look at it correctly, you know. Yeah, so well, that's no that's wars, what, little tiny wars. Look at the Russia the Ukraine war, which is on TV. It's not really a war, you know. No one, yeah, not for us. Not the pan- I think the well, Ukraine look at medicine. Look, look, look at medicine. Yeah, look at true. education. Look at yeah, technology as a whole. Yeah. That's so it. we digress. So summing up, closing thoughts. What do you What do you think? Uh, we're very excited. Yeah. Uh, obviously, very excited for Nexus Open Beta. Um, yeah, and just to just to keep going. So we've had a great time. So I want to thank you, Old Bull, oh, for uh, allowing us to uh, to do what we do. You know, I know we said uh, just. Uh, Trust us. Well, I didn't right trust you. you blindly. The fact that you have made 200 games certainly helps me. And it wasn't just me either. It's obviously the whole Foundable team and Mickey and yep. the exec team. That's and right. Like we yep. actually did our, we did our due diligence before we got into those conversations. So it's, it, I, I feel that we're in, we're, we're in a position to do some quite astounding things over the next couple of years. And I think people will look back on this and say, that was a bit of a match made in heaven. I feel yep. very lucky that Woodsy introduced me to Daniel and obviously yes. Daniel introduced me to you. You know, so yep. that was just, Woodsy is a, a childhood friend of my oldest son and um, they used to play Counter-Strike together and, you know, it was, um, you know, just, a, just I, I reached out to Woodsy and said, mate, I've hit the jackpot. Got a crypto company that's done really well. I'm in over my head. I need a gaming expert. Do you know anyone? And he goes, Jono, I know about five people. <laughs> and so he yeah. introduced me to yeah. introduced me to all those people. I went and met them all. And out of those five people, the one that stood out to me was Daniel. And we we went back and said, Daniel, let's what can we what can we do together? How can we work together? And can you help me by being an advisor? 
that's how it started. And obviously the Revan thing tripped it on its head and we ended up having to break Daniel's dreams of retiring and um, got him back in the saddle. Uh, look, um, at the end of the day, I love video games. Um, I've loved them since I was uh, six years old. So um, uh, I agree with Bo. Um, I feel a sense of um, excitement. Uh, the fact that we can make uh, original content that's new uh, and innovative uh, and f and fun to play uh, with, with, with with a great company like Playable Games, who is uh, you know uh, awesome to work with uh, and is is a really good team. Uh, we all seem aligned um you know uh you know uh you know making games is hard uh it's it's a, it's a difficult business it's a diff it's a difficult thing so um you know uh the fact that we've got some uh veterans with a with a excited community um uh where um you know we're, we're, we're in with it with a good shot uh actually and yeah, and, uh, and the right. proof will be in the pudding man like people play these games heaps of games come out uh, all, all all the time uh, and i'm i'm quietly confident um that uh, you know uh, um, people are going to respond people are going to respond to 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 what 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 we're doing uh, and people are going to have fun you know you you only keep playing games if they're fun at the end of the day you only watch a movie again if it's if if it's good really good uh, and yeah. you know con con content content is king yeah uh, at the end of the day so uh, uh, we're going to do our best we're going to work closely with you guys we're going to work closely with the community um and we're going to just um continue to deliver good content fantastic yeah, well guys thank you so much thank you. i really appreciate it thank you thank you